Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Strategic Policies and Resources Committee, Perth and Ross Council, on Wednesday, the 29th of January, 2020. Do um, we have any uh, apologies? We have Councillor Anderson substituting for Councillor Band, McEwen for Dugan, Jarvis for Forbes, <coughs> Illingworth for Shires, and Barnacle for Stewart. Okay, that's a comprehensive list. Any note on the list? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Are there any declarations of interest on any of the items of business before us this afternoon? No, thank you. Before we move on to the minutes, um, there's just a slight amendment to paper 3.6, which is the minute of the meeting of the Perth and Kinross Integration Joint Board on the 6th of November, that um, the agreed meeting date of the 4th of March has been changed to the 12th of February 2020 as the next date for the IGB meeting. Moving on to the minutes, the minute of the meeting of the SPNR committee of the 27th of November for approval and seconding and <coughs> signature. Agreed. The minute of the meeting of the appeals subcommittee of the 14th and 25th of November for noting. The minute of the meeting of the Employees Joint Consultative Committee of the 26th of September 19 for noting. The minute of the meeting of the Corporate Health and Safety and Wellbeing Consultative Committee of the 9th of September for noting. The minute of the meeting of the Tay Cities Region Joint Committee of the 20th of September for noting. <coughs> the minute of the meeting of Perth and Can Ross Integration Joint Board 6th of November including the amendment for noting. Okay. And then we move on to item four, which is the revenue budget 2019-20, and it's monitoring report number three. And I would ask Mr. Mackenzie to introduce. Thank you, convener, and good afternoon, councillors. As set out in section two and appendices one and two to the report, the latest projected outturn on service budgets is an estimated net underspend of approximately £2.2 million, which constitutes 0.75% of net service expenditure. This represents a further reduction in projected expenditure compared to the position reported to committee in November, and largely reflects increased staff slippage, additional income, reductions in property costs, and the rephasing of expenditure between years. The committee has requested to approve adjustments to the management budget for £1.6 million of additional grant funding, for updated projections and borrowing costs, for adjustments in respect of the transformation programme, and to and from earmarked reserves for individual projects as detailed in section 2.4 of the report. In addition, the Scottish Government have accelerated the payment of £2.1 million of ring fence funding for early learning and childcare which requires to be carried forward into next year. As noted in section three and detailed in appendix five to the report, the projected net overspend on the Perth and Can Ross Integration Joint Board budget is currently estimated at 3.6 million pounds, of which 2.1 million pounds relates to adult social care and will require to be met with the council under the terms of the integration scheme. This is broadly unchanged from the position previously reported to the committee in November. Expenditure in the housing revenue account remains projected to break even, with movements in the account currently anticipated to increase the revenue contribution to the housing capital programme by £112,000. Overall, the total net projected underspend on the 2019-28 general fund budget is currently £295,000. Happy to take questions, convener. Thank you very much, Mr Mackenzie. Are there any questions? Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm looking at um, section 2.4.5, um, which refers to PH2O. Um, that section refers to a briefing that I think had to be cancelled in the event that was due to happen on Monday just gone. 
So I wondered, therefore, if we could get a little bit of detail about um, what the background is behind the need to <coughs> move that funding to into the new financial year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who's again? My apologies. I'm. Councillor Bailey, first of all, the session has been moved to allow time for the executive officer team to consider the business case for PH2O. But I can assure the committee that progress has been made on the designs for PH2O and we look forward to hosting the information session in the next few weeks. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, convener. Um, I will have a supplementary to this question. Could I ask Sheena Devlin uh, under 2.1.7, I've asked this before about a year ago, it's about the pupil equity fund and it's about the underspend there of 556,000. Is that once again purely due to the difference between the financial year and the academic year and that it's effectively, it's going to be going forward a, a, a recurring item? Councillor Donaldson, you're quite right. We will um, see in continuing SPNR reports on underspend in pupil equity funding. A, a large part of that is due to the timing of receipt of that grant compared to the academic year. But another contributing factor is the fact that if you use pupil equity funding to engage staff, you pay staff on a monthly basis and so the amount will decrease incrementally as salaries are paid and not in a lump sum at the beginning. I do have a supplementary. It, um, I, I certainly see the pupil equity fund that there is certainly a clear element of recurring going forward. But it's the next item and that's on the early learning and childcare fund. And if one looks at the details, uh, underspend of um, uh, 2.1 million. Can I just ask with that, is that just purely again uh, uh, because the, 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 ta the, the cost of setting up, the time of setting it up, or is that likely to be a recurring item as well? And it's quite a, a big chunk of money. In terms of the planning for the expansion of early learning and childcare, each local authority was asked to produce a financial template and within that financial template, uh, we were to indicate how much money from the total pot of nationally available money we would expect to use in each of the years leading up to the introduction of 1140 hours. And what this represents here is that we have in fact received more money from the Scottish Government for this particular year than we had requested in our financial template. So the money will be spent but we've actually received more money than we'd requested at this time. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Lane. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, it's back to uh, Councillor Bailey's point there about the PH2O, uh, which is obviously will be one of the flagship uh, developments for the council, I would think, uh, moving forward. But we're, we're not having now the... Uh, update until uh, about, I think it's about a week before the budget. Uh, and obviously, we'd need to really know what position it is if we're setting a capital budget less than a week after. So it's just, how, how is how's the timing being pushed back affecting our ability to put enough capital in the budget for anything that we're thinking of doing moving forward? I don't know if you've got, I haven't, I haven't specifically got an answer to that. Um, I'm, I'm aware that um, drawing up a framework has, has proved more challenging, hence there's been a delay. Um, I think uh, maybe if, if you allow me some grace, I would come back to members and, and update them on that timeline. And there may be an interim. That's what I was going to ask for, if we could have a, a, a it doesn't have to be a full briefing, but just to, uh, to, to know where we are and what year that uh, any funding that, we, that the groups would wish to allocate, they know what year to put it into. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep, I'm happy to do that. We'll, we'll have a <coughs> some form of interim update 
to members of SPNR. Uh, thanks very much. Sorry, it would be more appropriate to give that update to all councillors. The full update could be all councillors or, or even the interim one, but the interim one is yep. at least to the BRG groups, which yep. can feed it back. I'll do that. Yep. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Um, paragraph 2.4.3 and 4 uh, regarding the Perth and Kinross uh, offer, there's £262,000 uh, of investment which was supposed to take forward. Uh, the, the offer is being uh, put back till future years, not simply uh, just into the, 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 the next financial year. Um, is there a, a, a risk that the, uh, the, the Perth and Kinross offer is being delayed or is that just a a uh, kind of unfortunate uh, d description in the report. Thank you very much. I'll ask Mrs Renton to ask the answer. Uh, Councillor Barrett, it is by no means being delayed. I think it's just a technical accounting issue um, just to ensure that the funding is, is secure um, for us in the next, next financial year. Any final questions, Councillor Barnacle? Thanks, Convener. Um, it's just regarding the correlation between local action partnerships and the community investment fund this is paras 249 to 2412 um, 2412 suggests that the community investment fund money has all been paid to approve projects but my understanding is that in Kinroshire the ward panel is still to make a decision um, on that element, so I'm just quitting that. My the, sorry, was to delay that decision. Um, and the rest of your question. Well, sorry, we're due to have a meeting in the coming month yeah. uh, on, on exactly that. So um, is 249 the underspend does that cover that or, or not? Uh, Mr. McKenzie will answer that. Thank you, Convener. Just, just for um, clarification, there are still resources um, remaining mm -hmm. within the Community Investment Fund to be allocated of approximately £292,000. Yeah. Page 53, Integrated Joint Board. And I think it's quite an important question. I just want to ask, under the risk share, we show 1.5 million NHS Tayside, 2.1 million Perth and Kinross. First of all, would I be right in saying if we were Angus or if we were Dundee, that uh, there would be a difference, it would be taken much nearer to 50-50 and also with that our discussions ongoing as to the current nature of the risk share agreement because it's quite a big ticket item. The Chief Executive will answer that. So Councillor Donaldson you are correct that if we were Dundee or Angus we would have a different risk sharing agreement. We have had discussions with NHS Tayside they are not inclined to relook at the risk sharing agreement with Perth and Kinross Council at this moment in time. And however persuasive our arguments are, I think you're indicating that's likely to remain the case. Is applied. I can assure you pressure has been applied and it is likely to remain the case. Okay, thank you very much. I'll move, move the paper. <coughs> the Head of Finance has already provided the committee with a detailed commentary of the contents of the latest revenue monitoring report. I welcome the latest projected outrun as it sets out an underspend of 295,000 in the current financial year. I am sure the committee will want to join me in thanking the officers from across the council for their competent management of public money. Given the financial challenges that we face over the next few years, this projected underspend is especially welcome. 
I also welcome confirmation of almost £330,000 of expenditure from the Community Investment Fund. This money will be spent on a host of projects across the Council and will make a significant difference to local communities and I look forward to further updates. Happy to move the paper. I thank you, Convener. I'd like to echo your thanks to the Head of Finance and the Chief Accountant for bringing the latest Revenue Budget Monitoring Report before the Committee and happy to second. Thank you. Here. Agreed, the paper. Any comments? No, thank you. Move on to item five. Which is the composite capital budget. 1920 Housing Investment Programme and the Monitoring Report Number 3. And I would ask Mr Mackenzie to again introduce. Thank you, Convener. The gross budget for the 10-year composite programme is currently estimated at £633.5 million. This is an increase of £1.2 million in the position reported to Committee in November, due mainly to the proposed inclusion of a low-carbon and active travel hub programme. Section 3 of the report summarises progress to date with the composite programme. Net expenditure to the 31st of December is approximately £26.4 million, or 52% of the revised budget. There are proposed adjustments to service capital budgets for the profiling of expenditure on the school estate, early learning and childcare, the placemaking programme, and for Lefham Wellbeing Hub, pending the outcome of a bid for additional external funding. These adjustments are set out in Appendices 1 and 2 to the report. Following the UK election in December, it is now anticipated that the Tay Cities deal will not formally be signed by the UK and Scottish governments until the spring. As set out within the report, the two capital projects which assume Tay Cities deal funding of a low carbon and active travel programme and, more substantively, the Perth City Hall redevelopment. While both projects are being progressed at risk, there is no indication that the funding for these projects will not be realised and the committee will be updated in progress of the T-Cities deal at the earliest opportunity. The current projected outturn for the composite programme in 2019-20 is approximately £50.7 million or 82% of the capital budget set by Council in February, which would represent an improvement upon last year. Section 4 summarises progress to date with the Housing Investment Programme. The budget for the five-year Housing Investment Programme is currently estimated at £69.5 million. Net expenditure to the end of December in the programme is £10.2 million, or 65% of the revised budget. There are proposed adjustments to the Housing Programme for the new build scheme at Hunting Tower, for the acceleration of expenditure in the Council House Buyback Programme, and for the bathroom modernisation programme. The current projected outturn for the housing investment programme is £15.8 million, which represents 113% of the budget approved by the Housing and Communities Committee in January, reflecting the acceleration of expenditure in the current year. Happy to take questions, Convener. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr Mackenzie? Councillor Donaldson? Councillor Barrett. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, paragraph 4.6 of the report refers to a £199,000 um, surplus um, on the HRA being able to be invested in the, uh, in, in the capital programme. Um, that's um, at odds with what we just saw in the, in the previous report, and is that due to a different cycle of reporting, Stuart, or do the figures not match? Because in the previous report, we said that there was a shortfall of 344,000 um, in terms of uh, CFCR to the, to, to, to the capital programme. Mr McKenzie. Thank you, Councillor Barr. I, was, I confess I was dreading this question. So, I will try and explain. Happy to oblige. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure as always, Councillor Barr. Um, the revenue monitoring report shows the movements between um, the, the various supports which, which you're seeing over a period of time. So the £112,000 is the movement in the CFCR position, not the absolute CFCR position. That's one challenge explained. In the capital report, just to help, um, what we're showing is a series of those movements which gets you to the 199 figure. That again isn't 
either the CFCR position or the outturn on the CFCR position. I know this is not helping by the look on your face, but basically we've got figures which are, sh are slightly different, and I will reflect on how those are presented in the future. I think um, Mr. McKenzie's given a comprehensive reflection of, of, of the anomaly, but I'm sure if Councillor Barrett wants a more in-depth response, Mr. McKenzie would be happy to give it. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Convener. I'm at paragraph 4.4 .4 on page 63, and I note that um, a further just over half a million pounds has been brought forward a year to facilitate the buyback of, of properties into the council stock. Um, can I ask whether that puts at risk um, the buying of properties um, in the future or whether it will be possible to make additional funds available in the following year to ensure that the programme continues? Thank you. Mrs. Renton. We continue to be con to committed to the buyback scheme, you know, sort of, and indeed the um, rent setting exercise, you know, sort of, which took place and which was approved by Housing and Communities Committee this morning, um, also had within the programme a continuation of the buyback. Any other questions? Councillor Lane. On the, sort of related to the buyback scheme, uh, do we actually go out and, and, and uh, search the market for houses that have become available or do we wait to, till people selling approach us? I think it's both, Councillor Ling, but I can double check that for you. Okay. Councillor Donaldson. Yeah, it's on page 57, that's the main table. And the approved position, 27th of November last year, so that's really just two months ago. And then the current estimate and for this financial year, it's a variation of, it's more than 10%. And for next year, it's a variation of about 6%. Just could um, the head of finance explain just, and then a, a significant move the other way in 22, 23. <coughs> Can you, the head of finance, just maybe explain why there is that variation uh, over a period of two months? Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Kavita, happy to do so. Um, the variation reflects the realignment and rephasing of expenditure, but if we turn to the table uh, which you referred to, Councillor Donaldson, that's showing the gross position. So a significant element of that is we've rephased expenditure on the Perth City Hall project, and therefore we've also rephased the anticipated income for the Tay Cities deal on that project. We draw some numbers up you come to quite a significant variation. In future years, what you're seeing is the adjustment of the budget for a range of projects, including Perth High School. So because the position um, on the table in paragraph 2.1 is shown gross, the numbers are quite significant. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? No. I'll move the paper. The Head of Finance has provided the committee with a detailed commentary on the contents of the Capital Monitoring Report. This comprehensive report summarises over 700 million of capital investment over the next decade. This investment, which will be welcomed by our citizens, businesses and visitors alike, will improve and enhance our schools, our roads, our bridges, our buildings and varied infrastructure across the whole of Perth and Kinross. In achieving this, I would like to place on record my continued thanks to officers across the Council for their sterling efforts to ensure the delivery of this administration's capital programme. I am sure that elected members across the Chamber will be aware of the most recent delay in the signing of the Tay Cities deal. While this delay is unfortunate, the latest information I have is that the deal will be signed this spring, and I very much look forward to progressing these plans. I also look forward to bringing details of the administration's new capital proposals to a special meeting of the Council on March the 4th. Happy to move the paper. Councillor Duff. Thank you, Convener. Happy to formally second. Okay. Can we agree the paper? Agreed. Thank you. Can I move on to paper six, which is the Local Development Plan 2 Delivery Programme 1920. 
The publication of the delivery programme is a significant step towards the implementation of the recently adopted LGP2, and I recommend that members agree to adopt the delivery programme for submission to Scottish ministers. Happy to move the paper. Happy to formally second. Do we have uh, any questions on this paper? We've, we've discussed it and had questions previously, and I'm aware there are questions coming up on the next paper, but it's just on this specific paper. Okay. Are we happy to agree? Agreed. We now uh, move on to item seven on the agenda, which is uh, an update on the progress with preparation of the supplementary guidance to support the local development plan. And at this point, as we've reached uh, two o'clock, it's appropriate, I think, that we um, have a short recess. There, there's some further information come to light to members of the committee, and I would propose a recess of 10 minutes, and we reconvene at 2.10. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your patience and indulgence, um, and just remind everybody that we're on paper seven, and we're doing an update on progress with the preparation of supplementary guidance for the local development plan. And I'd like to ask Mr. Marshall to introduce the paper for us, please. Thank you, convener. Uh, this report and the appendices provide the first annual report on the proposed program and pr priorities for preparing supplementary guidance post the adoption of our second local development plan in November 2019. Section two of the report provides a summary of the comments received on the various pieces of supplementary guidance published for consultation during 2019 and seeks approval to finalize and adopt these to support LDP2. I believe it demonstrates that good progress has been made with only four pieces of statutory guidance remaining to be prepared during 2020. Appendix two of the report sets out the proposed work program for both this and the other non-statutory guidance required to support LDP2. The re recommendation to members is to agree the 2020-21 work programme and the continued annual reporting on the progress with preparation of this guidance. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Marshall? Councillor Barnacle. Just one point about um, my request for consideration of the Oakle Hills as a regional park, which is mentioned in the report, and which was the subject of a letter I wrote to the convener. Um, I understand that it's not part of the landscape guidance regional parks, that's what you're saying. Um, although clearly it's, it's a landscape issue. Um, and there are no resources, which has always been the, the comment made about taking forward such an initiative. But there is a national draft review of regional parks. And I did wonder whether it might be possible to at least write to the neighboring authorities around the Oakle Hills to see what their take is on it going forward. That's the question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Marshall. Um, for, first point I would make is regional parks are not strictly a landscape designation, but they are designed to enhance recreation within, within areas. Uh, so I think you're right, it's not strictly part of the landscape guidance. Um, we meet from time to time with our colleagues and adjoining authorities um, and you know, be no objection to seeking their views on it. I would be happy with that. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Any further questions? No. Um, I'll move the paper. Sorry. The adoption of LDP2 in November 19 is a further illustration of this Council's support for sustainable development. The production of both statutory and non-statutory guidance provides additional certainty to developers in bringing forward their proposals that accord with LDP2. I would therefore commend the approval of the supplementary guidance as set out in the report for submission to Scottish ministers thereafter. 
I would also propose that the Council agrees the work programme as set out for 20, 2020 and 2021 as set out in Appendix 2. Do I have a second? I'm happy to call Mr. Finnat. Do we have an amendment? To amend Councillor Barnacle first. Thanks, um, convener. I, I had wanted to make an amendment in relation to the, um, the assessment in Para 224 on page 159 of the report in relation to the request by not only myself but other organisations for the Devon Gorge and the Cleesh Hills to be looked at in terms of local landscape areas. However, um, I was told that it was not competent, not competent to do the amendment in the form I had put forward. So we talked about a revision to that amendment, which is to delete recommendation three in the work programme and replace it with a remit to the chief executive and chief operating officer to review and report back to the next meeting of SPNR the work program for 2021 to incorporate a comprehensive review of the landscape supplementary guidance. That is the amendment. Okay, that's concurrent with that. Okay, I would ask for a seconder for the amendment. I'll call on a seconder. Councillor McEwen, a second. Do we have any further amendments? Councillor McCall. Yes, thank you, convener. I have an amendment. Um, as convener of um, planning and development, I'm, I'm aware of the issues that our rural businesses experience um, when posed with problems of succession. Um, our rural communities rely on ongoing economic activity of businesses passed from generation to generation, and I would like to propose the following amendment under section 3.3 of the economic activity for supplementary guidance, and I have a copy here, which I'm happy to be passed around. I'm also happy to read it, so I'll pass some of them along. That'd be great. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, very basically, the amendment is to, is to be inserted on page 12 after the paragraph of the section entitled New House to Supporting Existing Businesses, and it reads, in addition, no, a house may be permitted to allow for the passing of a rural business from one generation to the next. Evidence must be submitted in the form of a, of a business appraisal, which demonstrates that the business is financially sound and economically viable, that it will support at least one full-time permanent worker, and that the new house is essentially in order to to allow the passing of a business to the next generation and that the business has been managed by the current generation for at least the previous 10 years. Given that the occupancy of the house cannot be restricted to only one additional house will generally be considered per business unless the business appraisal demonstrates a need for more than one. And that's the amendment. Thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? From Convener. Uh, McCall's amendment. As an elected member for one of the most rural council wards in Scotland, I recognise the dilemma which currently exists over the current housing in the countryside policy and the, the opportunities for succession planning in relation to rural businesses and to working the land, and in particular, the impact on the farming community. I support Councillor McCall's amendment to incorporate this into the supplementary guidance as per the amendment before us to allow this council, council to give more flexible consideration to any planning applications of this nature, and I'm happy to second the amendment. Thank you. So <coughs> we have a motion, and, and we have two amendments. The first amendment um, from Councillor Barnacle, seconded by Councillor McEwen, the second by Councillor McCall, seconded by Councillor Duff. Um, given that, they, um, bear with me, um, <coughs> given that we have two separate amendments and, and the amendment um, from Councillor Barnacle has a significant resource implication in, in the Council. I am therefore minded not to incorporate it in the motion and that I would put it to a vote of this committee. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Barnacle. If I could... Convener. Um, it 
was my original intention to seek an in-house review, as you're probably aware of this issue, uh, because I don't think it's a huge issue in, in, in terms of the actual LLAs, but it is for these two areas. And I would have thought that would have been possible. I was told it's not. Uh, although we do have planning officers that look at wind farm applications, for example, and assess landscape. So I'm a bit circumspect about whether that's possible or not. And the idea that you have to go and review the whole thing rather than just two areas, if they're the only contentious ones, is again something that I feel the cost is exaggerated. But I would be happy to investigate ways of finding that money in order to take this forward. Otherwise, we will never get a change. It wasn't just too clear. You would be happy to? Investigate ways of finding the money to support the review. Otherwise, we will never get a change. And I'm not the only councillor that has this view. And also, there are a number of organisations who seek this change. So it's not just a question of me pushing this. I appreciate that, but we're, we're within the, the business of this committee, are you, are you changing your amendment? Or you're, you're content with your amendment, was with, but, but assuming your amendment is not incorporated into the motion, there will be a vote. If, if you're unsuccessful with the vote, you're still proposing to investigate. Is that what you're indicating? I am indeed. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can, can, can <coughs> I would invite questions okay. Okay. at the moment. Yep. Two points of order. Um, one is, um, I wonder in light of the fact that the two amendments affect different parts of the paper and are mutually exclusive, we might consider them separately. I think Lisa is indicating yes. Second one is that some of us on this side are finding it hard to understand which page 12 the reference is here. Um, th what's the page number in the document pack, please? Yeah, just to clarify, yeah. I, I did indicate the two, the two well, I, I did indicate we were dealing with page, first amendment. Can Sorry. I just say, it page 12 is referring to the appendix as is on the, online on committee papers. So it's Appendix 5, page 12. So if that, that's a response to that question, just to be clear to members, I, I would be happy to deal with the amendment separately, which is what I've indicated. Can I have any questions on the First Amendment? This is on Councillor Barnacle's amendment. Do you want your questions on that yes. one first? Um, I would like to ask uh, one of the officers, what, what, what would the financial resource uh, be or, or, or where would the, the, the lack of resources, the resource taking out of the team uh, to, to fulfil uh, the amendment, uh, what would be the effect of that? Sorry, my understanding in response to your question is that there would be um, a significant delay on other projects, but I would leave Mr. Marshall to respond to that. Yeah, if I can e explain that we uh, e explored the, the cost of employing consultants to do the work again, uh, obviously supported by officers as well. There's a significant amount of resource that has to go in fro from the officers as well. There's approximate cost of about 30,000 for the consultants, plus a significant amount of time, uh, officer time. Now, the, we have that within our budget, but it will mean we are not spending it on some other topic. Uh, I would su suggest that the other areas of supplementary guidance are not the areas we'd want to drop in terms of the work program, because we need them in place to give them the statutory cover to support the development plan. So we'd be looking at other areas of work and the significant area we're beginning to develop this year is starting to try and work with communities to deliver local place plans. 
which are going to be an important feature of the new style local development plans. So we haven't had a lot of time to think about it, but that's my gut reaction of what areas of work we would be put back if we were to engage in this process. Okay. I had a response, Councillor Barnacle. I don't know if Mrs. Renton, as head of service, would like to add anything to, to what Mr. Marshall had said. I, I think, you know, sort of that it's, you've already approved, you know, sort of the action plan, you know, sort of, and I think that that's a really important part, you know, sort of, um, while, you know, sort of there is funding, as Peter says, that's available. However, you know, sort of we're using that to do, you know, sort of this um, piece of work stops a lot of very other important work that you've already, you know, sort of indicated that it, it is a priority. Okay, we're, we're still on questions, Councillor Barnett, and I will give you another opportunity to sum up, if you like, maybe. Because I, I understand it, you're passionate about the subject, and, and hence I'll give you some leeway. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I just ask that if this... Uh, uh, if you were going to bring in someone and do this, would this be for the whole of Perth and Cross, or would this be solely for the Gorge and, and uh, parts of that area? It, it's my view that we'd have to review all of the guidance uh, looking at the criteria again. The, the purpose of the new methodology that was proposed by SNH and we used in this process was to try and give standardization, not just across Scotland, but across um, individual council areas. Because previously we had the old, what we called areas of great landscape value. And there was no relationship between the value of a, a site in one local authority as opposed to, to another. So great deal of inconsistency. So to get that consistency, um, I think we need to go through the, the process again. I think the, the other danger is if we were just to look at two specific areas and we include a feature such as the Devon Gorge, uh, who's to say we won't get from saying the Glen Armand, the is it Lumber Bridge Gorge there? Uh, Buckingham Spout, sorry. Yeah, it shouldn't be added as well. So. You know, I think you're better doing an overall review again. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Now, <coughs> we've exhausted questions, so we, we come to the vote, but I would give Councillor Barnacle the opportunity to sum up if he wishes. I find it very difficult, uh, Convener, because um, I was part of the review panel that the consultants put in place, and right up until the end of that, the people that took part in it were from the community councils locally and friends of the Oakles and myself, very involved in it, and both areas were scoring strongly right up until the end. And if you look at the guidelines on page 659, uh, because landscape is so subjective, in my one of my previous letters, I'd pointed out that the Cleish Hills met at least six of those ten, and the Gorge met at least eight. And that's why we feel, both myself and other organisations, feel so strongly about their exclusion. I had hoped we could have dealt with this without going through a full review, but I've been told there's no other way. Um, it it puts it into the long grass, to be honest, based on the other priorities the council have. And so I'm in a bit of a quandary. I would like the opportunity to explore finding the money um, and also would ask, how do you really get change? If you challenge a, a consultant's ruling, and I have information from other authorities on this, um, that you don't agree with because landscape is quite an emotional issue and precious to the people involved. How do you get change if you're constantly up against the fact that you have to review everything to get that change? And we've been here since 2014, so it's very, very difficult for me when I want the other LLAs to 
go forward with their guidance in this paper. I'm happy with all that. It's very difficult for me to prevent that, but equally I'm, I'm um, saddened that we have basically to put off the decision again to look at it. Okay. <coughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your submission, and um, I'm pleased that we've got to the state where we have a competent amendment, um, and, and you and officers have agreed to that amendment, but I am minded because of the resource implications that, that I feel it's appropriate to put this to a vote. So um, the motion is as uh, to uh, agree to the supplementary guidance as laid out in the paper, and Mrs. I am sorry, uh, the committee clerk will read out your amendment to it, and then we'll move to a vote. Okay, the motion is as per the paper to approve the supplementary guidance, remit to the deputy chief executive to finalise the supplementary guidance submitted to the Scottish ministers. Request the Deputy Chief Executive to report annually on the progress of the guidance and also delegate authority to approve the non-statutory guidance where there's only te minor technical changes. The, sorry, that was by Councillors Lyle and Ahern. The amendment by Councillors Barnacle and McEwen are the same but with um, of Recommendation 3 to remit to the Deputy Chief Executive and Councilor Chief Operator. Sorry, did I not write that? Apologies. Um, I report back to the next meeting of this committee the work programme for 2020-21 to incorporate a comprehensive review of the supplementary landscape guidance. A good vote, motion or amendment. Can I call out your name? Councillor Ahern. Motion. Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Bailey. Amendment. Barnacle. Amendment. Barrett. Amendment. Donaldson. Amendment. Duff. Motion. Illingworth. Motion. Jarvis. Motion. Ling. Amendment. Lyle. Motion. McCall. Motion. McCall. Amendment. McEwen. Amendment. Parrott. Motions carried by eight votes to seven. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for your patience in, in arriving at that decision. I think, Councillor Barakal, I, I, I have to be honest, I have some sympathy, and um, I will meet you in early course and we'll see if we can find an interim solution. I suspect it's not going to be the solution that, that is comprehensive, but we may find some way of making progress. Okay. So we now come to the second amendment and um, given the process that we've just gone through, um, I, I really feel it's appropriate to go through the second amendment um, by the same process. Are there any questions um, that any would like to offer? Can I would like highlight to ask an error on the I just want to highlight an error on the page that was sent out. It says um, on page 12 but it's actually page 14. Page 14, right, the, thank you for of that. Of the supplementary guidance, and that's what caused the confusion earlier. So that's, that's so why it's actually that's on page 14. My, yeah. Okay, have, have we any questions on, on the amendment? Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Convener. I'm in support of the principle of this amendment, but, but I'm concerned by what the wording allows. And I would start with the first three words, an additional house. And I'd say an additional house to what? Um, what if the same site already has two or three houses on it? And my, I have a concern with the last sentence, given that the occupancy, etc. cetera. Um, I, I'd like that sentence explained to me, please. I'm, I'm, I, I don't Could get what it means. Thank you. of understanding as to the, the business appraisal 
um, a, a business appraisal would, in my understanding, just for that part of the sentence, is, is usually call it carried out by an independent um, body, such as the SRUC or some other independent qualifying body. My, my concern, and, and it, perhaps I'm just not getting something, no. is that occupancy of a house cannot be restricted. Well, that, that relates to family and generation, perhaps. So I wonder what, why the next part of the sentence talks about business and business appraisal. I'm, I, I, I don't understand where that sentence <coughs> is going to. My, my understanding of that, and, and Mr. Marshall will maybe correct me, is that um, in, I think it was 2012, um, the then head of planning in Scotland um, wrote to all councils indicating that Section 75 agreements, which were legal agreements, that, that house occupancy was um, forever and a day related to that farm business. Um, that w it was no longer appropriate to put in Section 75s as an occupancy condition mm. on an additional house on a farm. And, and that is the, the policy that this council has adhered to to date. And that was, was a, an understanding, my belief, um, from, from Mr. McKinnon at that time mm -hmm. in 2012. And, and throughout Scotland, we've adhered to that. But other councils have taken other approaches, I think, is, is the clarification I would give on that. If that's mm -hmm. helpful, I don't know if Mr. Marshall wants to... to uh, uh, in, indeed, yes. you're, you're correct that it was a, a letter from the chief planning officer. The problem was that people who were being faced with an occupancy condition or Section 75 were finding it virtually impossible to get a mortgage or a loan from the lending institutions. Mm -hmm. So we were giving consents across Scotland which couldn't really be implemented because they couldn't get the finance for it. So it was ruled that we shouldn't uh, have these conditions, which has caused some difficulties in cases like this. Y your second question, I think, was about an additional house, what, yeah, what this meant? It, 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 was, it was actually the first. It's, yeah. it, the first three words say an additional house. Yeah. Now, wh what if there are what if this right, if you like, has already been exercised and there are already two houses on the site? Is, is, is a third allowed? Is a fourth allowed? Well, it, it, you, you we, develop we a debated, farm town. We debated this you know, wording ourselves, and, but there may be an example where there are you know, two brothers running the farm and, th and, the, and the father, so to s limit it to one house may not be practical and might, again, be putting barriers in the way. Uh, but I think you have to have a sensible and proactive approach. You can't have uh, the excuse for seven or eight houses you know, under that many okay. generations. So, 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 it's, uh, so in a sense it would be what one house per occasion unless the business case d s suggests two is sensible. My understanding, and, and I'll interrupt Mr. Marshall in his delivery of my, my understanding of, of, of the policy and the previous policy and, and of the Scottish Government's uh, Scottish Planning Act coming forward is that it would be restricted to one house per occasion, as you put it. Right, okay. okay. But future occasions with the passing of generations could allow more development? P potentially. Yeah, okay, thank you. <coughs> so would it be possible to remove the last part of the sentence? Restricted only to one additional house and, s and not have will generally be considered. Because my, my concern would be that um, you, you build a house, you let it, you build another house, you let it, you build another house, you let it, and it's open to uh, abuse. Whereas if you take away the, the, the part about uh, basically a business appraisal could demonstrate anything as we know, um, and I would have thought that uh, with the farm machinery and the less people working on farms, uh, I could understand, you know, father, son sort of thing, but to need a, a whole lot of uh, workers' houses, I think. Um, yeah, I no just I think I it could be of use. Uh, business appraisals, and, and Mr. Marshall may well correct me, but my understanding is that these are related to agricultural businesses. If you had a property development company or you had a, a letting agency, or, or some tenancy agency, then that would be a separate business. 
and not incorporated in the farm. I mean, you can... Yeah, but I bet we all know people who have farm, it has, it farms, has houses that they let out and then they want to build another house in the yes. it, that could be in this. But, but my understanding of the reason the government's proposing to bring in a section on succession is because the, um, we, we've hit a roadblock, if you like, with the current policy. Councillor McCall. I'd just like to ask a point of clarification. The motion states it's uh, inserted after the second paragraph, and that refers to non-farming businesses. Is that correct? And, but what we've been talking about here are the questions have been around farming-related decisions. So I'm not quite sure now. My, my understanding is that the, the succession part of the, the letter that was written to me related to agricultural businesses, not non-agricultural businesses. No, it says non-farming. Non-farming. Non-farm, yeah. So it says I'm not aware. It of just that. says non-farming businesses. That's the second paragraph in the in the paper, um, as opposed to farm bu bu farm businesses. So there could be other rural Thank agricultural you, businesses that are not farming related. I just want to be clear. It, it's my interpretation of the amendment that it's to cover rural businesses because there may be. What we felt when we read the submission that went to all members was that it was maybe going to exclude some other rural business where it maybe is equally important to keep uh, succession going to keep the building. So we, uh, our, our suggestion there was that it was a third paragraph that covered both the farming and the non-farming side of things to give equity really. Uh, after all, the, the purpose is to support the rural economy, not just farms. I wasn't opposing it, I was just trying for clarification. Um, <laughs> so that's thank you. Thank you, convener. <coughs> I live in an old residential farm building that the farmer sold onto the open market because maybe his children were too young and didn't want to live in it anymore. And within the last year, I've just had a four bedroom house, brand new house built next to me for the farmer's son. Uh, I think this is a possibility that will be open for abuse, where buildings that are argued as not, for you, not needed at a time could be sold. And then the revenue from that, all, all of a sudden we've got a demand, we're gonna build another house. And you just get, you, what you're gonna get here is a growth of rural houses. I'm not in the farming industry, but I live on a farm, in an old farm cottage. It was knocked together in the 70s, but it was sold by the farmer off the market, out, out of what this is trying to achieve. And you could argue, goes against what this is trying to do. And also farmers split their farms in half and sell them off and et cetera, et cetera. It, it, in some ways I see this as just wealth generation for people it who have access to land to build houses on. Am I just there's several this, points in there. Yeah, there's, there's, there's sort of devil's advocate point in there. I take that, Councillor McEwen, and you're quite right. It, 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 any, any action is open to uh, abuse and risk. Um, the, the, the point being that, that uh, my understanding, and, and I'm only working on the basis of the letter that I received, is that other authorities have introduced something like this because there has been a serious roadblock in succession planning, and um, this would help to alleviate it. If um, if you have a different view in, in that you, you consider the potential for abuse, then there's the opportunity to vote accordingly. I think the issue that I have, because I've known about this motion for approximately 20 minutes and really haven't had the time to bash this around and throw it around and throw these different examples, even amongst our own group, to yeah. actually discuss this and see where it goes and see what concerns we have that have no validity and what concerns we have that do have validity. Uh, I, uh, Councillors, councillors, we're in questions, not in comments. So can we ask questions, please? Can we have a recess, please? Yeah, I, I, I and, think and that, just, that just given that we've, we did that with the last paper, I'm content. For, for clarity. For convener, clarity. The, the cause of where they're intending to place this, this, this amendment, can we have absolute clarity that this is including farms and non-farming businesses? Um, it it, yep, it, it seems Marshall. to me in terms of... A, a, Yep. getting into comments. Okay, thank you. Mr. Marshall, just to clarify that, that we are inc we're including farms and non-farming businesses. Yes, that, that's the intention and that's the way I read the, the amendment. If it made it clearer, it could have a 
you know, an additional bit inserted before it, applying to both these categories to make that clear. Okay. Right. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll have a five to ten minute recess and uh, reconvene and vote. Thank you. We've, um, if everyone's ready, we would reconvene a minute early. Um, following discussions through the recess, uh, Councillor McCall and Councillor Duff have agreed to withdraw their amendment. Um, and uh, Mr. Marshall um, will make a short statement. Okay. Mr. Marshall. Yeah, we do appreciate that there's new guidance going to be coming out from the Scottish Government. We, we think um, you know, possibly by the end of the summer we should have some clarity on that and we'd be happy to bring back a paper on this issue, perhaps discussing at the Planning Member Officer Working Group in the first instance. Okay, if um, members are content with that, I'm happy to go along with that suggestion. Um, now, I invite comments. I think that's a very sensible uh, outcome uh, and glad the discussions led to that where we can all be on the one page and, and consider things as it affects Perth and Can Ross and the Perth and Ross context once we have more intel of what's coming through the Scottish Government planning review. So I think that's a, a, a good result. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments? Okay. Uh, Councillor Barrett. Just very briefly to say that you know all the information was contained in the report uh, that um, you know all was all we, we needed before uh, the rigmarole that we've just been through. So I think you know sort of scenes like this are, are avoidable, and perhaps we should consider that in future. Thank you very much. Equally, Councillor Barrett, I'd like to thank all the councillors in this committee for their cooperation. Can we agree the paper? Thank you. Now, excuse me, while we heave over to paper eight, which is the transformation programme. And we have the executive director to introduce Mrs. Renton. Thank you, convener. This report gives an update on phase four of the transformation programme with reports on the current projects as at the end of December 2019. Gives an overview of the progress to date and a brief explanation on the project status. Two broad projects have ended since the last update to committee, the review of housing and community care as it was, repair service, and the council fleet utilization and optimization review. The projects are managed by project boards, which report as appropriate um, any exceptions to the project plan which covers the identified milestones, risks, issues, costs and savings. The Strategic Investment and Improvement Board, which is made up of senior officers of the Council, then receives updates as appropriate and provides challenge to that process as well. Um, my colleagues and I are happy to take any questions with regard to this report. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for officers? Councillor Donaldson. Thanks, convener. It's headed up Transformation Programme 2015-2020. Can I ask what uh, happens beyond 2020? And I got the impression, I think it was from the Chief Exec earlier on, uh, a number of months back, that we're moving towards a new process. Can you just let me know, or are we going to get further Transformation Programme papers? Chief Executive. Councillor Donaldson, um, the transformation plan has served this council well, up to date. We now need to look at what's outstanding and integrate that within our mainstream work activities. So it would not be my intent to bring forward another transformation plan to SPNR. Supplementary. Does that mean then that we are moving towards a different approach in terms of change, managing change, that it's continuous improvement within service areas. And the counter to that, it's almost kind of a more Japanese approach, kind of Kaizen, continuous ongoing improvement. The danger though, perhaps, is that you end up with a silo approach and that 
various service areas don't link up in a, in a multi-purpose uh, project. Uh, I'll let the Chief Executive answer that. I understand the Japanese do quite well, though. Thank you. I'm not going to comment on that, Councillor Lyle. However, um, Councillor Donaldson, you are quite correct. We will move to a different process. We've already initiated a different approach in terms of our capital investment programme. We would expect improvement to happen across services, and there will be a way of monitoring and reporting that to SPNR, but not a separate process, because now change is everybody's day job. Any further questions? <coughs> no, thank you. I'll move the paper. The committee is asked to note progress in relation to the projects monitored within our transformation program 2015-20. The paper details the continued work to complete the projects and realize the outcomes as set out originally. I commend the paper to you. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to record our thanks to the executive director and to service manager Carolyn Mackey for bringing this report before the committee for noting and happy to second the report. Thank you. Do we have any comments? No, thank you. Well, um, uh, we'll close the meeting and I'd like to thank you all for your patience and for your contributions. Thank you.